The Tabernacle Choir and Orchestra at Temple Square present a music and the spoken word special, Blessings of Christmas. Conducting today's program is Mac Wilberg with special guest Hugh Bonneville and the Gabriel Trumpet Ensemble and organist Richard Elliott.
Now, Christmas is, of course, a time for celebrating new birth. It's a time for family, for giving. And in my house, anyway, we always raise a toast to absent friends, to those we have lost. And we share stories about them, bringing them back to life in our memory. And the account I want to share with you this Christmas season is just such a story. It's about a family who, in the darkest moments of life, found the hope and peace we associate with this season, the true spirit of Christmas, how it transformed them and also has blessed this world. In mid-November 1873, an ocean liner, the Ville de Havre, set sail from New York bound for France with 313 passengers on board. One can imagine their festive Atlantic crossing with ribbons of red, swags of evergreen and Christmas carols wafting through a dining room sparkling with candlelight. In a few days, they would make landfall in Europe just in time for Christmas in Paris. Anna Spafford and her four little girls were among the delighted passengers. They had come from Chicago. Annie, aged 11, Margaret Lee, nine, Bessie, five, and little Tanetta, aged two. Their father, Horatio, had intended to sail with them, but was detained on business. Not to worry, he assured his wife and children. He would book his passage in a few days, and soon they would be reunited in Paris, the city of light, celebrating the season of goodwill. And goodwill is what they needed. Two years earlier, the great Chicago fire had all but destroyed Horatio's business interests. So this journey was intended to restore hope and bring healing into their lives. Once on board the ship on the evening of November the 22nd, Anna and her girls knelt down, said their prayers, and fell asleep, dreaming of the Yuletide festivities to come. But at about two o'clock in the morning, they were suddenly jolted awake in their berths. Despite a clear, starry sky, the Ville de Havre had inexplicably collided with the Loch Hearn, an iron-hulled Scottish clipper. Lifeboats quickly filled with people. Many passengers leapt into the icy waters. Anna tried desperately to keep her children together, but the two eldest became separated in the confusion. Just 12 minutes after the impact, a wave washed over the deck and Anna was drawn under, together with her two youngest daughters. She held on to five-year-old Bessie until her strength gave out. Her last memory was of two-year-old Tanetta in her lace nightgown, torn from her grasp, getting smaller and smaller until she too finally disappeared. Later, the crew of the Loch Hearn found Anna unconscious, floating on a wooden plank. When the ship docked in Wales, Anna sent a telegram to her husband. It read, Saved alone. What shall I do? Horatio immediately sailed from New York. He wrote to a friend, 
There is just one thing in these days that has become magnificently clear. I must not lose faith. Four days into his voyage, on a Thursday evening, the captain summoned Mr. Spafford to the foredeck. By the crew's calculations, they were nearing the very place where Anna's ship had gone down, taking with it their four daughters, now resting some three miles below. But Horatio refused to look down. I did not think of our dear ones there, he later recounted. Instead, he gazed out across the rolling waves and up into moonlit sky. There and then, he began to formulate a simple expression of his faith, a verse that would become a hymn. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Only a few weeks earlier, in the same place on the open sea, Anna had experienced a similar awakening after her rescue, when she'd regained consciousness, she was overcome with despair and simply wanted to throw herself back into the ocean. What was life worth now? What could it ever be without her children? But then, it was as if she heard a voice in her mind and her heart. You are spared for a purpose, Anna. You have a work to do. Once they had returned to Chicago, Horatio sought the support and prayers of his congregation to help him face the dire financial straits in which he found himself. Anna gave birth to a boy and then a girl. But sorrow upon sorrow, that son, Horatio Jr., succumbed to scarlet fever at the age of three. Then, a year later, another daughter was born. Only two of their seven children lived to maturity. But the Spaffords never yielded hope. Christmas season of 1873, the Spaffords became even more certain that God loves all his children, whoever they are, and whatever tribulations they may suffer. In 1881, the family moved to Jerusalem and established there an American colony not far from the little town of Bethlehem. We celebrated Christmas. Although deeply religious, their purpose was not to proselytize, but to serve people of all backgrounds, relieving the effects of poverty,
disease and strife, wherever it was found. Seven years later, Horatio himself died. Grieving once again, Anna Spafford had every reason to give up, but she did not. Every life has contradictions and imperfections, and hers was no exception. But when it mattered most, in her most profound spiritual crisis, when all seemed lost, Anna found the strength to move forward and to turn outward, to continue the work she and her husband had begun. And the seed of service which they had planted bore sweet fruit indeed. In time, their daughter Bertha expanded the Spafford's humanitarian work with the simple intent of rescuing those who had experienced the shipwrecks of life as they had. During World War I, she led the way in organizing soup kitchens for refugees. She also oversaw hospitals for wounded soldiers on all sides of the conflict. One Christmas Eve, on her way to Bethlehem, Bertha met a Bedouin man, his ailing wife, and their newborn son traveling to Jerusalem by donkey. Later, Bertha wrote, here stood before me a rustic Madonna and babe, and similar to Mary's plight, there was no place for them to stay. By the next morning, the mother had died, and Bertha was asked to take care of the child. She agreed. She named the little boy Noel. And within the week, she had taken in two more orphaned babies. And so began the Spafford family's most enduring charitable work, a hospital for children. She explained, we make no distinction in nationality or creed. The only requirement being that people absolutely need our help. And some of the Spafford's charitable work continues to this day in the children's center that bears the family name. For nearly 150 years, millions have sung and have been lifted by Horatio's hymn, but most have not been aware of the circumstances in which it was written. But they have been strengthened by its universal message. Horatio's words echo with the story of Christmas. A child was born in Bethlehem, bringing peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Because of him and through his example, the human spirit can rise above tragedy. Whenever, however, we suffer our own night of sorrow, God's love does shine in the darkness. Hope can heal the wounded soul. And the Christmas work of giving of loving, serving, and of rescuing is ours if we choose to make it so. And as we do, we join with saints and angels to rejoice and sing. It is well. It is well with my soul.
Thank you for joining the Tabernacle Choir and Orchestra at Temple Square for this Christmas special originating from historic Temple Square in Salt Lake City. Please join us again for music and the spoken word. Until we meet again, may peace be with you this day and always.